We're in session 18 of our review of the Gospel of Matthew, and you could call this the Olivet Discourse Part 2, where we're going to take a look at one of the passages that is widely assumed to be the Olivet Discourse, namely the passage in Luke 21. And um, this, I hope, will be useful background for you, give you a whole fresh insight as to what really transpired in that first century, and more relevantly, uh, what's forthcoming. So let's just jump in. Let's back up and take a look at the design of the Gospels. We've done this in most of these studies, as you know, that Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah Nagid, the Messiah, the King, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark, the suffering servant. Luke, being a Gentile doctor, focuses on his humanity, the Son of Man. And John is the only one of the three that really focuses on who he is that he's the Son of God. The genealogies in each of them support that. Every detail of each of the Gospels support their primary design. Um, The genealogy of Matthew, as any Jew would, would, starts with Abraham and goes through the legal line through Joseph. Mark, focusing on a servant, does not even deal with his pedigree. There's no no genealogy in Mark. Luke focuses on his humanity, starting with Adam, and he goes down through David, when he gets to David, he takes a left turn. He doesn't go through Solomon the way Matthew does, the first surviving son of Bathsheba. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, a son by the name of Nathan, not Nathan the prophet, a different Nathan, down through Mary, the bloodline. And, uh, and John, of course, has a genealogy. Most people wouldn't recognize the first few verses uh, describe the genealogy of the pre-existent one, in effect. But uh, we'll move on. Matthew focuses on what Jesus said, what he expresses. Mark's a shooting script, what he did. Luke, what his humanity, what he felt. John, who he was. And uh, they're each writing to a slightly different audience. Uh, and uh, the first miracle and the how it ends all supports their basic thesis all the way through to the end. And uh, we've talked about this before. And we focus, of course, on the Matthew account. We're going to take a little deviation and take a look at Luke's reflection of this thing. We're going to contrast Matthew 24 versus Luke 21. And again, the issues are the destruction of Jerusalem. Is it 70 AD or the one yet future? What about the abomination of desolation? Luke never mentions it. What is it? When did it happen? Is it, has it yet? The great tribulation we talked about last time quite a bit. The parable of the fig tree shows up in both accounts slightly differently. And each speak of a generation that will not pass away. Is it the same group or a different group? And the doctrine of eminence lurks behind all of this. The whole idea that Jesus can come back for us at any moment with any preconditioned notions. That's taught all through the New Testament. And we talked about the whole idea of our prologue, epistemology, the study of knowledge, its scope and limits, how not to be deceived and to establish the integrity of God's Word and then through this establish the identity of Christ and then carefully understand with precision what He actually said. So we establish the integrity of the, the total package that package establishes beyond any reasonable doubt the identity of Christ, and knowing who He is then authenticates the whole package. That's our approach. And we talked about hermeneutics. We acknowledge rhetorical devices. There are allegories, but you never build doctrine on them. And uh, there are parallel accounts and separate accounts, and you let the context determine it. And uh, always, I always lean for precision as we go through these studies because of a high view of text. We went through this last time. Okay. Now... In the eschatology, just this is by way of summary. Eschatology divides, first major divide is amillennial, premillennial. Postmillennials you don't find very often today. Uh, preterism is on the rise within the amillennial camp, if you will. We, are, we lean, obviously, to the, the premillennial view. In fact, we're very, not only pre-trib, we're pre-70th week of Daniel in our, in our perceptions. But the main point is, is that most denominations are amillennial and post-trib. And the fundamentalists or independent Bible churches are typically premillennial fundamentalists, if you will. The main point I want to make is that your willingness to allegorize Scripture will determine where you flow on this chart. And if you have a high willingness to treat things just sort of broad symbols, it means whatever you think it might mean, you could swing to the left. If you take it very precisely um, with a great emphasis on the literal applications, you tend to be on the right side of the chart. So your hermeneutics determines your eschatology, is my premise. But there are hazards to presuppositions. We talked about last time how Mosaic 
Judaism degraded to Pharisaical Judaism by regarding what they call the oral law, which then gets codified in, the, in a written form called the Talmud, and how that led ultimately the, the, Ka, the Kabbalah and the Hasidics in the 18th and 12th, uh, the 12th and 18th centuries, respectively. But the main point is these drifts away from the text is what leads to the, the uh, deviations, if you will, the, the tangled tethers, as I call them. We have the same risks as we tend to, if we don't tend to really stick to what the text really says, precisely. But there's another error that we encounter that we're right in the middle of, this whole idea of harmonizing the Gospels. Assuming that Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 are the same discord. They may be, they may not. Let's take a look at that. And uh, is the, all of the discourse past or future is one of the big debates raging among some denominations. Are these one briefing or several? I'm going to show you why I believe they're quite distinctly different briefings, not the same despite their similarities. We talked about resolving power. I want to remind you that if you take a, a cheap telescope, you'll see a star. That's fine. But if you, if you improve the optics substantially, you can often tell that it's a double star, not just one. That's called resolving power. It's a, it's a measure of quality in optics. A, a high resolving power is a more expensive telescope. And that's sort of the same thing we're running into here with Matthew 24 and Luke 21. The beginning of sorrows is in common to both, and plus another, a few other phrases. So let's again we just refresh our memory of Matthew 24, and then we're going to dissect Luke 21 carefully. But let's remind ourselves how Matthew 24 um, flowed out. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to him, See, not all these things, verily I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, and we just determined from Mark that there's four of those guys, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the age. And so, and it's Mark that tells us it was Peter, James, John, and Andrew that were among the four. That's where we pick that up. And uh, of all his followers, there's obviously the general public, then there's the 70, then there's the 12, there's the inner circle, which are the favored bunch. There's at least four occasions when Peter, James, and John are present. Uh, John, uh, Andrew joins them with all the discourse, but the other, Jairus' daughter, Transfiguration, Gethsemane, are all demonstrate that these three, Peter, James, and John, enjoyed a private inner circle status somehow. And Jesus answered, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. These are non-signs, in effect. But then we get to verse eight, 7 and 8. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of birth pangs or sorrows. This cluster shows up in Revelation as well as Luke and Matthew. The false Christ, the wars, the famines, pestilence, earthquakes occur in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 9, in Luke 21, verses 4 through 24, and Revelation 6 through 12. So I'm going to cluster these. They're going to be important in the chart that we're going to develop here shortly. But then Jesus went on to say, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. That word then, I suggested you mark in your Bibles because we're going to contrast that word with the 12th verse of Luke 21 with some surprising implications. Let's move on. Jesus said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love or the agape of many shall wax cold, and he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then we have this pivotal verse, the one that you really want to Master, verse 15 of Matthew 24, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that authenticates it, if you will, and it's all through the book of Daniel, obviously. Stand in the holy place, and it, there's a call for every one of us, whoso readeth, let him understand. So we now have an obligation to do our homework here. We talked about Antiochus Epiphanes, how he uh, offered a swine in every village, erected his uh, idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies and so forth. We had a lot more background on the previous one. I won't try to summarize it all. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Then we have, and let me give, uh, summarize the chronology. Daniel wrote in the fifth, uh, at the beginning of the fifth century. Um, returned to Jerusalem 
uh, occurred about 509, uh, 539 uh, B.C. The abomination of desolation occurs in the second century. The Septuagint got translated in the third century B.C. And the Olivet Discourse occurs in the first century A.D. The point is that Jesus is making reference to the abomination, uh, the abomination of desolation as a future event, but obviously we, it gains its rhetorical relevance from history. So it happened back in 164 B.C., and it's going to happen again. And so we understand its significance by the fact that we can examine history. Okay, and we talked the difference between the fullness of the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles. Let's not get confused because Luke is going to use the times of the Gentiles, which started with Nebuchadnezzar and will end with the Antichrist. Not to be confused with the term Paul uses of the church, calling it the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 11.25. But anyway, at the end of the tribulation is when we have the, the kingdom set up. The 70th week is a, is a target of, our, of Matthew's focus here. The interval, when we studied Daniel 70 weeks, we had the first 25, verse 25 had the 69 weeks, which predicted the exact day that Jesus presented himself as a king. But verse 26 deals with an interval before we even get to the last, the 70th week. There's a gap during which the Messiah is executed the temple is destroyed, as indeed it was. And from history, we know that that's turned at least 38 years between the, uh, uh, um, from the time that, uh, of the triumphal entry until the destruction of the temple. But from experience, we've noticed that's, that's been over 1,900 years. But it's the 70th week that's one of the most documented periods of time in both the Old and New Testament. And it's defined by the covenant being enforced by this world leader, it's split into two halves by this peculiar political event that occurs in the Holy of Holies where this world leader sets himself up to be worshipped. And that splits the seven-year period into two, two halves. And Jesus himself labels the three and a half years, the second three and a half years, as the Great Tribulation. And so there's lots of confusion because people speak of a seven-year tribulation. What they really are alluding to is the 70th week of Daniel. But it's not, the tribulation is not seven years, it's three and a half. The first three and a half may be a false peace that raises this guy, uh, his, his stature in the, in, on the planet Earth. But Matthew can indeed let them which be in Judea. Notice that word then. Then. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop. What is the then? What triggers the then? The abomination of desolation. Exactly. <coughs> then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that ye that ye, your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Obviously speaking to Jews here. And obviously when you see the abomination of desolation, when you know that that's happened, when you see it on television, whatever, you split, you don't even stop to pack, you run for it and get out of there. And... Uh, for then shall be great tribulation. There's the Lord labeling this period of time, the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world at this time, nor ever shall be, except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. He's not talking about the Holocaust in Europe. This is something yet future. And unless those days be shortened, there would be no flesh on the planet Earth saved. It's going to, the first Holocaust took one Jew and three on the planet Earth. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9 says the next one will take two out of three. Okay. And Jesus is simply quoting from Daniel 12. He's, uh, a time of trouble such as never since there, there was a nation even at that same time. Jeremiah uses a slightly different phrase for the same thing, a time of Jacob's trouble. It's the focus on this is Israel. And then Matthew continued, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. That's scary, isn't it? Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, is he in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even out of the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Wheresoever the carcasses, there will the eagles be gathered together. Many different views of that verse, I personally suspect, can't prove, I suspect that's just referring to the, we will be with Christ, the body of Christ. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. I submit to you, I don't think this has happened yet. I think this is yet future. <laughs> And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Immediately after the tribulation, we have all these cosmic things happening. I submit to you that has not happened yet. We haven't had the tribulation yet. We haven't had these major issues. So we have the covenant in force, the abomination of desolation, the second coming. The question is, where does the church get raptured? The amillennialists would sort of adopt a post-tribulational view that the rapture, the resurrection of the, or the, the catching of the saints and so forth occur uh, essentially with the return of Christ. That's their view. We believe that it happens before the 70th week of Daniel because of 2 Thessalonians 2 and several other passages. There are some that recognize that the church is clearly taken up before the great tribulation and they would be called mid-tribulations, meaning they, they, they believe the rapture will occur in the middle of the week. Both the mid-week, the mid-tribulation gang and the post-tribulation gang, in effect, deny the doctrine of eminence. If you recognize that there's no event that has to occur before the Lord gathers his own, then, then you would be, you, 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 uh, that view is decimated by being mid- or post-trib because they have all kinds of events that have to occur before the rapture can occur. For example, the, the, the emergence of the Antichrist and so forth. Anyway, let's move on. Um, we believe that the next event to happen in this scenario is the rapture itself. By some distance ahead of the 70th week. It could be hours, it could be days or weeks, who knows. But it's uh, they're, they're, because the, after the rapture, the Antichrist is revealed according to Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2. And once he's revealed, he has to rise to power to enforce the covenant. That could be a day, it could be many months, it could be years, who knows. You know, anyway, going on, he'll send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. This is Matthew's account. Luke's will be slightly different, maybe illuminating in that regard. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. For that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And as Mark points out, even the Son does not know. But that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Rather remarkable insight from Peter. Mark is basically the secretary for Peter's gospel. Then the, as, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And this begs the question, what do we mean by the days of Noah? For that you need to study Genesis 6 carefully. But continuing here, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the, into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. There's again another call to eminence, if you will. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. The good man is an unfortunate translation of a term that actually just simply means the master or the head of the house. He's not necessarily a good guy at all. He's, it's just a term for the master. And the, in this case, the master is Satan. He, he runs the place. And Jesus is, is going to take, is going to come to break up his house. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, he that shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, that my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, but an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and point him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are some people that try to apply this to post-tribulational viewpoint. I think that's probably a misapplication, but it does give you pause. Let's move on. Matthew 24 and Luke 21 have some er elements in common. We're going to discover that the wars, famines, earthquakes, and so forth, the beginning of sorrows, is a cluster of signs alluded to by both of these guys. Also, that ultimately at the very end, 
there's going to be cosmic upheaval, sun and moon and stars and all sorts of stuff. Both of them make allusions to this, but in slightly different ways. What Matthew did, he talked about wars, famines, earthquakes. These are the beginning of sorrows. And his next verse says, then, that is after those, then shall you see the, the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Verse 15 of Matthew. In other words, Matthew jumps right, after discussing these signs, he focuses on what happens after those signs, namely the abomination of desolation. So he jumps right in to talk about that those events that occur from the abomination of desolation until the second coming of Christ. So what he talks about there, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, what, what uh, Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble. You with me so far? That's all, about, all of this so far was by a summary warm-up to get into the Luke account. Now Luke's going to take a little different view. Let's take a look and see what Luke says. And I'm going to suggest to you it's not on the, count, it's not on the Mount of Olives at all. Luke chapter 21, verse 5, And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So that must have been a kind of a discouraging announcement to make. We're going to discover at the end of this briefing that he's giving this briefing in the temple during the day, not on the Mount of Olives at night. That's, that, so get the sense here. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? What, shall, what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? He said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. There it is again. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not, therefore, after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. So far, it's tracking pretty good, isn't it? Okay. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and the great earthquake shall be in divers places, the famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. So far, that sounds like the beginning of sorrows that we found out in Matthew, right? Same things all the way through. In Matthew, we had the false Christ wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. Same thing in Luke, Revelation. Let's move on, verse 11. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Notice verse 12, mark it in your Bible. Luke then says, or I should say Jesus in Luke says, but before all these. See the difference? Matthew is talking about events that will happen after this cluster of signs. Luke mentions the same cluster, but then says, before these things, let me tell you what's going to happen. So Luke's going to talk about things that Matthew does not. Matthew's going to talk about things that Luke does not. We want to understand that. I'll diagram it before we're through. Anyway, Mark verse 12, Luke, uh, Jesus says, But before all these, they shall lay their hands on the, you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Before all these, mark that down. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and a wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. Well, that's a neat thing to cling to. They're going to need it. In your patience, possess ye your souls. Now notice his instructions are a little different than Matthew's. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Matthew didn't talk about that at all. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, that sounds similar. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. He's saying not only do you get out of town, don't let your friends come back into town. I'll show you why in a minute. For these be the day of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So far, so good. Let's do a little homework and understand what happened after this. Right after the crucifixion, 
Vespasian was ordered by Nero to attack, to, to, to take over, to, to get order in Judea, the whole area. He succeeded, he and his son, Titus, as a general, under the, Vespasian being a senior general, Titus' his son with him, they conquered the Galilee, all the towns. The only one left was Jerusalem. They were getting ready to put a siege on Jerusalem. And they attacked all the cities in the Galilee and so forth. Except a very important event occurs. Nero, who ordered this, dies. In June of 68 AD, Nero dies. What does that lead to? Anarchy and civil war. In Rome, of course. Galba assumes the rulership, and he's murdered by January. So not even six months go by, and Galba is murdered. Ortho takes, uh, he takes over, but he's defeated, and he commits suicide in April, only a couple of months later. Then Vitellius took over, but he's murdered by his own troops by December of that year, okay? So this is a mess. Can you imagine the world empire? In Rome, you've got all this struggle for power. Vespasian plays his cards right, and he takes over as emperor. He goes to Rome and kicks butt, as it were, takes charge, and brings order. And he takes over and he undoes most of the mess that Nero had, all the debts and the disaster characterized by, his, by Nero, the predecessor. And these guys, of course, have taken care of, they've, they've, killed, they've knocked themselves out of the game. So Vespasian succeeds as emperor. Okay, what happens back in Jerusalem? Titus is left there to complete the siege to Jerusalem. There's an 18-month period in which his troops are at, at you know, Titus, Vespasian had been ordered by Nero to, to, to attack Jerusalem, but Nero's dead. See, that, that, that erases the blackboard. And through that 18 months of turbulence, finally Vespasian goes to Rome and he takes over. Now Titus is clear, obviously instructed by his father, to follow through and complete the job. This is all in Josephus, Wars of the Jews, volume 6, chapter 6, verse 1 and following. Now, what happens, of course, you get that, once you get the picture, the Roman soldiers, the, four, the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th legions are out there, but they haven't laid siege to the city yet. But they're all around because they've just succeeded in the Galilee. But there's, better than, there's over a year here of milling around and and armies atrophy in the barracks. They need to be engaged. Now we learn from Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, that the Christians who heard the message that Luke records did what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, get out of town. Don't let your friends return. What happened? According to Eusebius, book 3, chapter 5, verse 1 and following, the Christians left Jerusalem and went to Pella, a city in, uh, in Betrea, which, Berea, in, in, which is uh, east of the Jordan, Berea. So they're safe. According to Eusebius, no Christians got killed in the fall of Jerusalem because they followed the instructions that Jesus gave them in Luke 21. Follow me? Okay. Kind of fun. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for they shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon his people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Jerusalem is not going to have peace until the Prince of Peace comes. They'll have a false peace when the Antichrist establishes it. Not until then. Roadmap or no roadmap. There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars upon the earth, distress of nations and perplexity and sea and waves rolling, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking, for after, looking after those things which are coming on the earth, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Whenever I read that verse, I remember Walter Martin. We were on his board, and we always, always wince when he would do this, but he, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking for the, after those things which are coming upon the earth. And he always gesture like a saucer, a flying saucer landing upon the earth. He, he was convinced that was UFOs, you know. 
And not that it isn't, but we always felt that would discredit, if he went down that path, it would discredit his ministry. Looking for those things which are coming on the earth and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. So that's the second coming, of course. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Praise God, your redemption. And that's a releasing affected by the payment of a ransom. It occurs nine times in, the, in, in, in this sense in the, in the New Testament. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Notice that all the trees. I don't think it's appropriate to try to make the fig tree a specific nation or something in this usage here. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now sh uh, shoot forth and ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. That's his point. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So even though these things are stressful, they're encouraging because it's doing exactly what God said it's going to do. Okay. He said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now this is a grabber. He's talking there to people who are to flee for their own protection to, to uh, Pella, right? Before the fall of Jerusalem, 70 AD. 38 years after he said this, the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem and we had the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 38 years. The same length of time that Israel wandered in the wilderness after their failure at Kadesh Barnea. The 38 years of that generation that were wasted because of unbelief. Here's a generation that got su survived because they did believe him. See the contrast? And it's 38 years. Now, it's also interesting here. Here's another demonstration of the deity of Jesus Christ, especially to those that were alive in that day. Can you imagine? He told them in the temple, when you see the armies, get out of town right now. They did. And a million and a half men, women, and children were slaughtered in the nine months of that siege of Titus. No Christians were lost, according to Eusebius. This generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness or the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Boy. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we have the beginning of sorrows, the same group of things that uh, are in both cases. But they also, all of them, Matthew, Luke, and also Revelation, talks about this cosmic upheaval at the end. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, famines, pestilence, and fearful sights, great signs that shall be in heaven. But before all these, and this is a repeat, uh, before all these, that's, in other words, Luke's focus his whole presentation is pretty much focuses on the events that occur before this cluster of signs. And then he has a wrap-up at the very end. Let's see. Luke says, but before all these, Matthew says, then shall they. See, before all these, the beginning of sorrows is what Luke focuses on. Then shall they is what Matthew. Matthew talks about after. Both of them are using that cluster of signs as a, as a reference point. And we're talking about false Christ, wars, famines, and so forth. And Luke, Luke says, before those things, Matthew says, after these things, then shall they. Get the difference, very distinctive difference. There's more coming. Again, this resolving power. We have Luke 21 and Matthew 24, beginning of sorrows is the, is the watershed. Luke says, before these things, certain things are going to happen. Matthew speaks about after these, then these things shall happen. The desolation of Jerusalem, number one, the first desolation, which was in 70 A.D., Matthew talks about the desolation of Jerusalem under the world leader, the, the abomination of desolation and all of that. And uh, Luke talks, he tells, he's talking to the first generation after his death. This generation shall not pass away till all these be fulfilled. When Matthew speaks of this generation, he's speaking to that generation that sees the abomination of desolation and following. Different generations. One's the first generation, the other's the last generation. 
They're different presentations by the same person. You know, it's interesting. Um, I have members of my staff that travel with me as we talk across the country. And I'll give the same talk many times to different audiences. And those that travel with me recognize, obviously, that maybe 80% of my talk is identical to these different audiences. But I'll tailor 10 or 20% of it or some percentage of it to the particular audience. How sophisticated are they? If they're new believers, that's one thing. If they're real prophecy buffs that have been through some of the troubled passages, it's, in other words, my talk will drop on the same references, but the emphasis will be tailored to the audience I'm speaking to. Matthew is a private briefing to the insiders at night on the Mount of Olives. This, Luke's presentation, is to the general believers in the temple during the day. I'll show you that in a minute. So we have Matthew 24, Luke 21. Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes and the cosmic upheavals being two major areas in common. Matthew talks about the abomination of desolation, what happens after that, the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, and then, of course, the big climax. Luke talks about what happens before the wars, famines, and earthquakes, and so forth. And he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And both of them have distinctives that make them very relevant. Where we get into trouble is our presumption that they're both the same presentation. They're not. They include elements that are similar, but they include elements that are distinctively different. And I hope this chart helps. Now, so Matthew talk, uh, Luke talks about what I'll call desolation number one of Jerusalem. Matthew, desolation number two, the one that happens at the end times. There's two major dissolutions in view here. And it's confusing then that leads to this confusion that's being promoted by the preterists saying, well, it all happened long ago. Clearly, Luke did. Matthew hasn't. They're very distinctively different in that regard. So Luke is talking to the first generation, Matthew, the last generation. Are we together so far? Then the question is, where do the seven letters of seven churches fit in? I'm going to suggest to you they fit in prior to the beginning of sorrows because they're ahead of chapter 6 of Revelation. They're Revelation 2 and 3. And if, you take, if you've been through our, our study of that, you know that these seven letters of seven churches profile, among other things, the history of the church. They have personal, homiletic, and prophetic implications at least. And uh, Ephesus speaks of the apostolic church, Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamus, the married church. What Satan couldn't accomplish by persecution, he accomplished by uh, marrying them to the world. That leads to the, what I'll call the medieval church. And out of that comes the, the, what most of our denominational churches. And out of that comes some missionary churches and ultimately the apostate church. And uh, we notice that the first three letters have the promises to the overcomer postscripted outside the body of the letter. So they're distinctive architecturally for some reason. The last four have the promises incorporated within the body of the letter. It gets our attention that somehow the first three and the last four have some distinctives. We also discover the last four have explicit references to a second coming. The first three do not. That's kind of interesting. So we infer, and furthermore, one of the last four has an explicit promise that unless they turn around, they're going to be thrust into the Great Tribulation. That's interesting. One of the last four is an explicit promise that they will be spared from the very time of the Great Tribulation. And uh, so that gets everyone's attention. What happens about these others? Who knows? That depends on their individual uh, uh, walk of faith, I'm sure. But in any case, that's, one, that's a prophetic... That's why we suggest the seven letters fill in that little gap. Okay. But there's something else that is rather provocative. And that is that Luke doesn't even mention the Great Tribulation at all. It's not in his presentation at all. I get the impression that Luke's uh, accounting of Christ's presentation is specifically addressed to the believers that were alive at that time that were going to be facing the fall of Jerusalem 70 AD. They had no need to focus on events that far distant. Matthew's presentation, for whatever reason, seems to focus on the end times. It seems to be almost a handbook for the Jewish believers after the abomination of desolation. So it's interesting that Luke, being a Gentile, is focusing on the, on the Christians of that generation. Matthew is focusing, uh, Matthew's account is focusing uh, as a handbook at the end. I think that's kind of interesting. In Luke 21, we find, he says, in the daytime, 
he was teaching in the temple. And at night he went out and abode in the Mount of Olives, which is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. So I'm, it's, I'm convinced that the Luke 21 account is not the same as the um, Matthew, the Olivet Discourse as such. It's always bundled with it. In some respects it's similar. But I think that, that bundling can be misleading. And that's really the essence uh, of, I think there's a hermeneutical lesson for all of us in all of this. Matthew is speaking to the Jews. It's a private briefing on the Mount of Olives, as makes clear both Matthew and Mark. Luke's account is to the Gentiles in the temple. They're obviously believers, Jewish and, and, and proselyte believers. And uh, so, in eschatology, the abomina abomination of desolation is to stand in the holy place. Some people try to make the worship of the Roman ensigns at the gate abominate desolation. People who tried to advocate that haven't done their homework, frankly. Uh, but you'll find people that try to make other things. There's some people that regard the Dome of the Rock as the abomination of desolation. And I understand why they feel that way, but because the, the uh, Arabic inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock say, God does not beget and is not begotten. It, that's just a denial of Jesus Christ. So people of faith regard that whole monstrosity as an abomination of desolation. That's a colorful label, but that confuses the idioms from what Jesus was actually talking about and, uh, and Antiochus Epiphanes. It's interesting that um, Caligula, and I think it was about 40 AD, I think, had ordered Petronius, this general in Judea, to put his image in the Holy of Holies. Petronius realized if he tried to do that, he, he would have a repeat of what happened back couple of centuries earlier under the Maccabean revolt. So he refused to do that. When Caligula found out that he didn't follow his orders, he sent out orders for Petronius to be executed. But then Caligula dies, and by a mix-up at sea, the message of his death arrived in Judea before his orders to have Petronius killed. And when the, when the order giver dies, it nullifies his orders. So Petronius escaped with his skin. But it's interesting to notice how God seems to intervene to prevent a repeat of the abomination of desolation in those early years. Once the temple's destroyed in 70 AD, there is no way to create an abomination of desolation. The very existence of that as a milestone in the future that Jesus points to is a demonstration that the temple will be rebuilt and be in operation in order to be desecrated once again. That's why we as Christians take such interest in uh, aspirations of the Jews to rebuild their temple. It's not our issue, it's their issue, but we watch it with great interest. Uh, that's one reason the Knesset had us reinstitute our temple conferences this past, in our last trip. And uh, they're encouraging us to do that again because they're, you know, they, they, that's a, a very meaningful issue before uh, the, the, uh, the Jew in, in uh, Jerusalem. So we, we monitor that with great interest. We have good friends that are in the middle of all of that. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's not our issue except as an observer, of course. And uh, the hiatus of the siege in 70 AD is fascinating. It's as if God intervened to allow his faithful remnant to get to safety before this horrible, horrible siege and, uh, by, uh, uh, by the Romans. And so the deity of Christ. I'm fascinated by the prophecies that is extant in Luke, uh, Luke's account because those 38 years were specifically... Uh, with great precision uh, testified by Jesus Christ himself. So it's one of these overlooked testimonies, in my opinion. So the destruction of Jerusalem we've dealt with, the, the, there, the, there's two of them, that's our conclusion. The abomination of the lesson, it did happen in the past, but it will happen again. And the great tribulation we've identified, the peril of the fig tree, uh, which generation will pass away, it depends which set aside you're talking about. And the doctrine of eminence you need to study for yourself because that doctrine of eminence affects each of us personally. You need to understand that Jesus can come back tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. And one of the implications of that, the more we study the prophetic horizon, that's why we monitor the strategic trends in all our materials. Every one of them is biblically relevant. And it's not any one of them, it's all of them converging that causes us to recognize 
that the furniture is being moved into place for the final climax. And if that's true, that should galvanize every one of us to get serious about our faith. At the personal level, every one of us should resolve before we leave this room to raise the bar on your personal walk. I have no idea what that means for each of us, but each one of us, no matter where we're at, there's something we could be doing that we're not. A little more time in prayer. A little more serious about a daily reading program in the Bible. A little more serious about a study time. Different. Reading, just reading it through is one thing. Diligent study is quite another. The idea of being part of a small group. Find one. Join one. If not, start one. It's not hard. We'll help you. But whatever it is, raise the bar on your personal walk. Whatever that might mean for you in your situation. Also, what it means is that whatever God has called you to do, you should do with a higher degree of urgency. There are some people that are very, very concerned about the future of America. George Tennant, before he left office with George Bush, he said he believes that Al-Qaeda already has nukes planted in U.S. cities. The strategy is to get a half a dozen or more at one time. Maybe he's right, maybe he's not. Jerry Corsi and others have published books pointing out that Iran is practicing. We, in fact, we know from intelligence sources that Iran is pra practicing EMP attacks. They're launching medium-range ballistic missiles from container ships in the Caspian Sea, detonating them at altitude. The intelligence community recognizes what they're doing is practicing an electromagnetic pulse attack. We've also discovered by analyzing the data of the 1962 nuclear blasts, we know that a high-altitude nuclear blast causes a huge magnetic pulse that's powerful enough to wipe out electronics connected to a long wire a thousand miles away. And they've also, in studying this, they've discovered that if one bomb thrown at altitude, no, no, no accuracy is necessary, detonated 100, 140 miles up, will, wipe, will plunge the United States back to the 19th century. We not only use telecommunications power and all microcircuits connected to reasonable wires, but it destroys our entire infrastructure. Telecommunications, power networks, you need telecom to run the power networks, by the way, and other things. The analysis of that has shaken the E-ring of the Pentagon. They realize we are a vulnerable country. We are a one-bomb country. Israel recognizes they are a one-bomb country, one bomb over Tel Aviv, and it's over for them. But the U.S. is not much better off. If Iran can get a container ship a couple hundred miles off the eastern seaboard that successfully launches the Sahab 3 missile over the eastern seaboard, you'll take out the infrastructure of 70% of the population of the United States. No, if these things are, as we see these clouds on the horizon, as we, as we grieve and worry over the accelerating decline of America in its legal system, in its uh, political system, in its entertainment system, its media, what have you. Um, many, many thinking people are getting very discouraged because there's no protection or, or shepherding of our heritage, the most blessed heritage of any nation in the history of mankind. And there aren't teachers that can teach our kids because they don't understand it either. We've now through several generations of abandonment of, of any real understanding of how we were founded, where there even there's questions of having the Ten Commandments in courtrooms or that in God we trust on our coins or one nation under God and our Pledge of Allegiance. All these things are up for grabs. You've got to be kidding. The, uh, you look at the politicians and it's of, of both parties. I'm not here to disparage the Democrats uh, alone, all of them. Our military cemeteries are filled with patriots who died giving their lives for everything that our politicians are, are now advocating. I mean, they're, they're, they died to, to prevent that. How futile it must seem. But if all that's true, our real question is not this country or our heritage. Our real question is, what is God calling you to do? Every... Every one of us 
If I ask you how many are saved, every hand would go up in this audience. My question then would follow would be, uh, what have you done with it? God has called you into the body of Christ for a mission. And your adventure is to find out what that, admi- that mission is and then pursue it with a sense of urgency. So find out what God is calling you to. For, and there's probably no p- two people in this room that have the same calling. But if you don't make that calling, nobody else is. Because you've been, I believe God is teleological, that he does things with a purpose. If he's, if he's called you to faith, he's called you for a purpose. And your challenge is to prayerfully, by studying the word of God and praying diligently, discover what it is he's calling you to. And then to embrace that calling with a new sense of urgency. Because if we're right and the time is short, what you're going to do, you better do now. That's what I think the doctrine of eminence means for every one of us individually. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's bow our hearts. Father, we stagger as we begin to embrace the extremes that you've gone to that we might live. We thank you, Father, that by your grace you've called us, not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed your Son, Jesus Christ, to purchase our liberty from the law, to purchase our redemption, our access to you. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that he is so diligent to open the Scriptures to the diligent. We pray, Father, that you would just increase in each one of us a new appetite, a renewed hunger for your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord, but further, Father, that we each might be more discerning, more perceptive as to precisely what you'd have of each of us in the days that remain. We thrill, Father, as we discover these exciting demonstrations of your precision and your caring. And yet, Father, as we behold our horizon and we sense the hoofbeats of what's coming, we do seek discernment, Father, that we might know what it is you would have each of us do. We understand that opportunity is not mandate, that you have called each one of us to a specific task. Oh, Father, we would pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, make that evidently clear to each of us that we might be each more fruitful stewards of the opportunities that you have provided for us. We just thank you, Father, that in your kingdom there are no accidents, that we're all here right now at this very moment by your divine appointment. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, we would acquit those appointments diligently as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.